Oh, there we go. I want to let you know that, that, that media is here and they are um, uh, going to also want to talk to our speaker afterwards. So without uh, delaying anything any further, I'd like to invite Dr. Ramirez up to introduce our speaker. Julio? Well, as always, it's a pleasure for us to uh, be part of the Department of Medicine Ground Rounds. And, and uh, in the Division of Infectious Diseases, a couple of months ago, we knew that we have this Ground Round coming. Of course, the topic was different. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but this is the, the, the beauty of being an ID doctor. Uh, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, and then uh, now, uh, with this uh, problem that we are uh, facing, with a coronavirus, uh, and then we decided that this is going to be probably the best topic for Grand Rounds. Uh, and to give this uh, presentation, uh, we have today uh, one member of the division, uh, Forrest Arnold, you know, or you know uh, Forrest. Uh, Forrest came to us from the University of Tennessee. He did a, a residency there, uh, and, and he was an ID uh, fellow in 2001 here at the University of Louisville. Now he's an associate uh, professor. Uh, and Forrest is also the hospital epidemiologist for the University of Louisville Hospital. And we've been having a lot of discussion with different institutions uh, in town. We are trying to get ready just in case if we have to face here at home the, this uh, problem with the coronavirus. And then Forrest is going to give us an, an overview. And then it's going to be a lot of time for uh, questions and answers. Forrest, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you taking out uh, time in your morning, and I'll try to make this worth your while. Uh, I wish that staff and Strep and E. coli would just take a break for a couple months while we deal with this, but alas, we have to do everything all at once. Uh, I'm going to talk about the new SARS coronavirus. That is the official name, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, and that is the virus that causes COVID-19 that you've heard of which is coronavirus disease 2019. So SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19. And throughout this talk, I'm going to call it SARS-CoV-2. It's been uh, in 75,000 people now, and about 1,000 of whom have been outside of China. And um, about over 500 of those have been on a cruise ship off the coast of Japan. So because most of it is still in uh, China, the World Health Organization, has called it an epidemic, but we all know it has potential to be a pandemic, but they haven't called it that because we know what happens if you call it a pandemic. <laughs> I don't have any disclosures. I'll jump right into the first case. On December 20th, 61-year-old man had a fever and cough for a week, then presented with worsening symptoms. Respiratory distress developed after seven days in the hospital and worsened further over the ensuing two days, necessitating mechanical intubation and ventilation. He had been to a Seaford wholesale market where live and dead animals are sold. A chest x-ray at the time of intubation was obtained. This, uh, we have eight days into the hospitalization, and even at 11 days, the ARDS is even worse. Now we'll jump to case number two. January 19, 2020, 35-year-old man presented to an urgent care clinic in Sonomish County, Washington, with a four-day history of cough and subjective fever. On checking into the clinic, and you can imagine this is your clinic, the patient put on a mask in the waiting room. After waiting approximately 20 minutes, he was taken into an examination room and underwent evaluation by a provider. He disclosed that he had returned to Washington State on January 15th, after traveling to visit family in Wuhan, China. The patient stated that he had seen a health alert from the CDC about the novel coronavirus outbreak in China, and because of his symptoms and recent travel, decided to see a healthcare provider. His chest X-ray was read as normal at that time. He was examined and tested for a rapid flu A and B, which were negative. It was also sent for a full respiratory viral panel. 
Washington State Health Department was put, um, called and clarified that he had not been to the seafood market or around someone who was sick. He was designated as a person under investigation, PUI, and a novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 test was obtained. He was sent home to be in isolation. Two days later, the viral PCR panel was negative, which includes endemic coronavirus, but the SARS-CoV-2 test that the CDC did was positive and he was admitted. He was given supportive care. White blood cell count was 3.9, fibrinogen 477, and the procalcitonin was normal. His chest x-ray at the time of admission, and you might see a faint um, infiltrate there in the left lower lobe. And this was his hospital course, and what you see is he came from China halfway around the world and went to work the next day. This is a high caliber individual. And then the next day he had a fever. Next day he still had his fever and he stayed at home and then he presented to the urgent care that I just went over. So he kept his fever for about a week. His cough was longer than that. He had a little bit of runny nose. Fatigue was most of the time and then there were some scattered GI symptoms throughout his course. So here's the outline I'm gonna go over today. And first we'll overview coronavirus and the outbreak. Coronavirus belongs to the family Coronaviridae. And there are four genera, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Humans can get the first two, but animals can get all four. The anatomy is quite simple. There's a single-stranded reverse sense RNA it's surrounded by a membrane, and then you have these spike proteins on the outside, which you can see on electron micrograph here, that gives coronavirus its name, corona meaning crown in Latin. This is coronavirus on a human cell, and those spikes help it attach to human cells. So coronavirus uh, starts in some type of animal, usually a bat or a rodent, and then if it infects humans, it's through an intermediary host, such as a camel or a cow or a civet cat, and then uh, gets to a human. So what this slide outlines is that some of what we've forgotten, is that there's four types of endemic coronavirus that we see every year, even in Louisville. And they have these letters and numbers. And then there are two, now three, serious coronaviruses, SARS that we had in 2002, 2003, that we had a grand rounds on back then, uh, MERS, and now SARS-CoV-2. So the alpha coronavirus was the first one discovered in 1966, quite a long time ago, the HCoV-229E, and it was followed up closely with a beta coronavirus, OC43, in 1967, and then we didn't hear any more discoveries of coronavirus until that SARS outbreak in 2002. At that time, it stirred up some research and a couple other endemic coronaviruses were discovered. And then it was another decade and we had the MERS coronavirus and now we have SARS-CoV-2. SARS, the original SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, infected over 8,000 people killed over 700 and had a mortality rate of about 10%. It infected people in 26 countries, which ironically enough is about uh, how many countries people have been infected with the new SARS coronavirus, but there were two exceptions. There was one case in Colombia where we have not had a SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, and we haven't had any in South Africa, although we had one in Egypt. Then MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, is in uh, 27 countries, and it's well in near the Middle East. There were 2,500 cases, about 850 deaths with a much higher mortality rate, 35%. So you see, he is gonna get the uh, coronavirus, but she, she probably will too. <laughs> the uh, endemic coronaviruses are 229E, OC43, then NL63 and HKU1. And we've been taught that it's just the common cold. But we have questions about that. Is it really just the common cold? How does 
endemic coronavirus, since we're not so familiar with it, compared to something we're more familiar with, like the flu? And what about this uh, endemic coronavirus? How does it compare to the new SARS-2 virus? And so Dr. Ramirez said, if the Chinese can build a hospital in a week, we can publish two papers in a week. So let's get on it. What we've done in the past is we've had influenza studies. And so everybody got a respiratory viral panel. And so in that panel contains coronavirus, which we never paid much attention to. So we look back to see if we had people with coronavirus that were admitted with community-acquired pneumonia, because everybody in the database had pneumonia. And lo and behold, we did have people, 66 in fact, were admitted with uh, endemic coronavirus. So we could compare those people to uh, the flu, because it was over 200 people in the database with flu. And then we could also compare the people with endemic coronavirus to one of the Lancet papers that came out early that had 41 people with SARS-CoV-2. So the race was on. This was a screenshot from the image, and you see now I'm down to six days to publish the paper. We've got all our papers ready to go, and we're crunching uh, the work. Here's some of the results. In the age groups, you see that endemic coronavirus acts a lot like influenza, in that you see uh, older people get influenza. We already know that. And so do people with endemic coronavirus. So the SARS-CoV-2 in that first study in the Lancet showed that the people were in the more young age group. When you look at the outcomes, when you compare people with endemic coronavirus to influenza, there wasn't much difference. They had about the same time to clinical stability, three days to two days. The length of stay was approximately the same, five days to four days. And the mortality was also about the same. You see the numbers are different, one to 10, but the percentile, 2% versus 4% is not um, significant. And then even as you go out 30 days, six months, the mortality is, uh, it starts to spread, but it's still not statistically significant until you reach a year. We follow our people for a year, and those with influenza, 17% were dead after a year, whereas the people with endemic coronavirus, 32%, and this number is significant with a p-value of 0 0.048. When we compared the endemic coronavirus to the people in the Lancet who had SARS-CoV-2, we found that everybody had bilateral infiltrates. We had 42 people that didn't have a co-infection that were just endemic coronavirus, and they all had bilateral infiltrates, and so did the people in the Lancet article. There were some differences, though. SARS-CoV-2, the patients were younger, had more comorbidities, lower white blood cell count, higher liver enzymes, and higher in-hospital mortality. So they also had higher non-invasive ventilation, as you could see with the difference there. So here's an early histogram of the current outbreak I want to go over. One of the first things that was reported is that there were a few cases, but the three of them were international. So the Imperial London College took that information and made a prediction that even though China was saying there were a few cases, they said that there was actually 2,000, over 2,000 cases. And they based this on some information, which was the three international cases, the fact that over 3,300 people fly out of Wuhan every day. Wuhan is about 11 million people. The airport serves 19 million people. And the onset to illness or the incubation period, with it being about eight days, they predicted over 2,000 people probably had coronavirus. As you can imagine, the Chinese government did not like that paper. And they said it was just an estimation, and those were the higher numbers. But they published another paper three days later. And with this, they published this curve that said, we're going to have 20,000 people. And when you look now that it's uh, February 20th, you look back in time, we reached 20,000 on February 4th. And so their prediction was uh, actually pretty accurate. So the other things that happened is that uh, on the beginning of December, early January, China 
informed the World Health Organization. And then the SARS-CoV-2 was identified as the virus that was causing all these uh, respiratory illnesses. And so China, uh, a few days later, published the uh, gene sequence of the novel virus, which they didn't do in 2002. In fact, uh, they've been a little more forthcoming this time and quicker to share information. So that is online. There it is. It's public domain if you want to see it, and laboratories can access it, and they have. So um, towards the middle of February, China started checking temperatures in anybody who was leaving the country, and then uh, they shared the reagent probes and primers. Now what happened after that, I spliced in this other uh, histogram, which is kind of blurry. Um, but anyway, what is 50 cases on the left? Over here on the green histogram is 500. So it really took off. So let's look at a, a better histogram. So what I just showed you are these little blips here. So here's the first US case on January 20th. And then Wuhan went into lockdown. Nobody comes in, nobody goes out. Then we had selective US airports beginning to screen people, and the death toll topped 100. So on, uh, later in January, the U of L provost sent out uh, an email that said that we were closely monitoring the outbreak, and I would make fun of that, except that I was part of the closely monitoring. So uh, the two-week quarantines also started at that time. The United States had not had quarantines for 60 years. The last time we did <clears throat> was for smallpox. And then the death toll uh, topped 200. This is a card that the CDC was passing out to people that were coming directly from China that basically said if you're sick, contact a doctor. There's an outbreak in China of respiratory illness. <clears throat> so this is uh, pictures of China building that hospital. And you have to clear a lot of ground. You just grab every backhoe you can. And uh, you can watch the three-minute fast-forward video online. I don't want to take time to do that, but it's so impressive. I do want to show you a couple pictures. Uh, they worked tirelessly night and day. They even called in some Americans to help. <laughs> okay, y'all are laughing, but these guys work double, triple shifts, and uh, they really need... Uh, our respect. These are prefabricated buildings. The, they didn't have time for cement to cure, so they laid it down and they just uh, hoist them in with cranes. And then after a while, you see this thing beginning to take shape. A thousand beds is huge, and this was uh, filling that. The only problem is I understand this hospital is still not open. It's been about a month. But to get that up even in a month is quite impressive. So here's where we are with the epidemic. Um, right here is a Wednesday. It looks like we've kind of come over the hump, which is good. And then Thursday happened. Wow. And what happened here was that they defined how they're um, defining SARS-CoV-2. And so instead of using the fancy test and sending it off, they just began doing it by looking at imaging. So they were doing it radiographically, which is completely appropriate in any epidemic. We diagnose influenza in the middle of an epidemic sometimes. So when they just looked at x-rays, we got 15,000 people on one day, which caught them up a lot. Now, as of this morning, we have maybe a little improvement here coming down. Total cases are over 75,000. Cases in China, 74,000. Then the global without China is about 1,000 of those. And over 2,000 people have died. You can follow this in real time on fancy websites. This one's out of Johns Hopkins. I took about a week ago where it'll plot the country, where it is. You can zoom in and out. Here's a curve for the number of cases in China. And you see this is uh, non-China countries. And it'll track the deaths as well. It also tracks how many have recovered. So now I want to go over the clinical presentation. This is a curve that a lot of people are interested in because it's the onset of illness or the incubation period. We've all heard that there's a two-week quarantine, but what about this little snag out here? 
And what they found was, when they went back, was that the people that were diagnosed in this last week were actually re-exposed here. So they really fell in within the two weeks because it was about four to ten days when they were diagnosed. So here's a figure out of that first Lancet article I mentioned that goes over the time to event for some things. And you have a week to admission, eight days to shortness of breath, then you have nine days to ARDS and ten and a half days to the ICU. I redid this figure uh, not just because it took time and looks better, but because there's actually been about nine studies that have clinical data that have been published so far in Lancet, um, JAMA, and the New England Journal. So some of them describe time to event as well, and I put them in here and redid the figure. So here are the papers. I took those out, inserted the data, and now we have 604 people instead of 41, and you see the lines shift. So now we have shortness of breath, six days, admission, eight days, which makes more sense. You get shorter breath, and then you go to the hospital. You go to the hospital and then get shorter breath. Um, so time to ARDS was eight days, and then ICU 10 days, which speaks to their lack of resources. If you're here and you have ARDS, you're in the ICU. And I'm sure that's the way it usually is there. But their ICU beds are full, so these people are getting ARDS on the floor, and then in another couple days, there's an ICU bed open up, and they go there. So some other things I was able to do when I put all the papers together was have the number of patients. Uh, and the median age was 57. That's a average of the median ages, so it's a mean median age if that is a real thing. Anyways, about 57, older than just the one article alone. 41% female. Nearly everybody had a fever. Most people had a cough. A lot of people had myalgias. A few people had a headache. And only seven people had diarrhea, but that's a very significant amount because I'm going to go over a study in a minute that came out with 139 people. And the few people that had only GI symptoms and diarrhea were not placed in isolation when they got there. And so they ended up spreading their coronavirus to um, healthcare workers and other patients. When I uh, averaged the comorbidities, it's, you can see that there was a significant amount of diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, smoking, COPD, and chronic liver disease. And then each study listed 100 labs. And so I tried to tease out of there, which ones do I see recurring over and over? And these were some of the ones. A normal to low white blood cell count, a normal to increased inflammatory markers, then an increased LDH, increased fibrinogen, and increased creatinine after five days in those who deteriorated. In the beginning, there was a lot of people that had been to these wet markets, but as the studies went on uh, and the people were transmitting to each other and the market was closed, then there's less so from the market. Now we'll go over imaging. This is a chest x-ray from somebody who is admitted to the hospital on day one. And this is day two. ARDS definitely present there. And this is, well, this is literally a polar bear in a snowstorm. These chest x-rays are useless. But it tells you, residents, that you can publish a paper with some useless information if it has something very valuable. And this comes from the very paper that defined SARS-CoV-2 as the etiology of the pneumonia. They didn't get published for their chest x-ray. So let's go over some chest x-rays that are more worthwhile. Here you see a man at admission, and then as the days progress, you can see at day three, five, and six um, that the infiltrates get better. Where's Jason? Can he, somebody hit the light up there and I can't see anything. This is a 52-year-old male, and you see on day five, the infiltrates are pretty significant, and then by day 19, he appears to be getting better. The top is three cuts from the same, um, from the same CT scan, and the bottom three are different cuts from a different uh, CT scan. So upper left-hand corner, 65-year-old female, and then upper right-hand corner, 66-year-old male, and what you see in all these four of these different people are that there are scattered bilateral infiltrates, just like we found. And uh, the first study showed 
earlier. Here's a 53-year-old male, day eight, or female, day eight, and then on the right, a 40-year-old man with a more significant disease. So now let's talk about infection prevention and control. Uh, this is the study with 139 patients, and that study should have just had these people, but a small fraction had diarrhea. And so what they did was uh, n they didn't get put in isolation, and so um, not purposely, but their SARS-CoV-2 was spread to healthcare workers and then some other patients. So almost 40% uh, percent of the patients in this study were people that their infection was spread nosocomially. So infection control is very um, important. This is an ophthalmologist. The ophthalmologist, he posted this picture on social media at the top to warn his uh, colleagues about a new serious coronavirus that, or he didn't know what it was at the time, but he, he did it even before it was identified to say this is maybe going around and you need to be uh, alert for that. Presumably this is him back at work with a mask on, and then this is him at his funeral. So we need to be diligent with our infection prevention and control. A recent headline says over 1,700 healthcare workers have had SARS-CoV-2. So some of the questions we need to answer with infection prevention and control is how is it transmitted? Um, in the beginning, CDC admittedly said they were overdoing the personal protective equipment because they weren't sure how it was transmitted. Then it was named SARS-CoV-2, which told them it was very similar to, obviously, SARS from 2002. If you look up the appendix to show what type of isolation that should be, then it's actually airborne droplet and contact for SARS-CoV from 2002, and that's what it is at this time for SARS-CoV-2. So then another question is how contagious is it, low, medium, high, and how severe is the disease, low, medium, or high. So one way that uh, epidemiologists can gauge how contagious a disease is is to say how many people would it infect if one person had it. And that's a complicated formula, but it, it comes out to a number where you can just say, okay, if you have MERS, for example, number one on the list there, then it would infect one other person. So this is called the r not, And as we go down in this list, the diseases become more contagious. You'll recognize all of those because they're um, uh, serious infections, they're serious in the sense that they're contagious. The two most contagious diseases you see are measles and pertussis, infecting so many people, um, other people, when you have it. So what you can do is plot how contagious something is on this x-axis, and then you can um, also plot how severe the disease is on the y-axis. Now, if you have, for example, something way over here, this might be very contagious, but not too serious. That's like the common cold. But up here would be something like rabies that's very severe and kills almost 100% of people. I think one person has been saved, but it's not really contagious unless that person bites somebody or their organs are transplanted to somebody, which has happened, but I mean, essentially it's not contagious. So you can think of rabies as being up here and the common cold being down here, and nothing is in this upper right-hand box. That would be a very contagious disease that is very severe. That would cause a pandemic easily. So if we look at all of our diseases and we plot them out, one through nine, across the contagiousness based on these numbers, this is where they fall. Stay with me. Now, if you consider the severity of disease, these numbers will uh, move, and you see the one that, uh, such as this, is number three, Ebola, has a 60% mortality rate, and uh, fortunately it's not terribly contagious, but it is. And then so these are our two measles and pertussis. They're very contagious, and for the most part, they're not near as serious as the other diseases. So number four is the 2002 version of SARS. Number one is MERS, and so they think that SARS-CoV-2 is gonna lie somewhere in between there on this scale. 
So now <clears throat> I'm going to go over four concepts with infection prevention and control. Isolation precautions. Well, so for SARS-CoV-2, we need to have a dedicated room, and preferably one with negative pressure, which I know you probably don't have in clinic, but um, we do in the hospital, so we'll use them. And then we'll use the airborne droplet and contact isolation that I spoke of earlier. <clears throat> the next thing I'll talk about is hand hygiene. And I have to make sure I don't hyperventilate because I've stood at this podium, I've stood on the floor, I, I've uh, done a lot to talk about people needing to wash their hands and uh, I'm not getting very far. In fact, a figure that shows our hand hygiene for over a year is just over one out of two. That is not good. The, the truth is that somebody in here has the oldest medical education. And that person had a mentor, and that mentor, that whole generation taught them how not to wash their hands. And so we've been handing that down to our residents and our students, and the time is, is to stop. It was, it was to stop when Semmelweis published his original research and showed that women um, that were delivering babies, the, uh, not the doctors, but the, the other ladies, I forget what they are, anyway, they were washing their hands, midwives, thank you. They were washing their hands and the mothers were not getting infections. The doctors weren't washing their hands and the mothers were getting infections at a higher rate. He published that. He published that 100 years before that mentor lived, 15 years before the Civil War. Okay, this is not new data. And since then, there have been a 1,000 articles that have been published that say, you wash your hands, you have less patient infections. So of those one out of two people, I'm going to assume that all of you are the people that wash their hands. And so I can't do this alone, and I need you to, to be upstairs to help me to tell others to wash their hands. That's an uncomfortable thing to do, but I give you permission to use my name in vain. Dr. Arnold said so. And then if, if they want to come, I'm going to show them this slide. Here's a... Uh, Everybody broken down, and the best people on this list, physical therapists and pastors, are at 80%, which still isn't very good. Okay, this is internal medicine grand rounds. We're, we're right here, 57%, and look, we're teaching our residents and our students to uh, wash their hands half the time. Residents aren't even at one out of two, and medical students are knocking on the door 50%. That's nothing to brag about. So if somebody has a problem with you, they, you just direct them to me, and I'll sit them down, and I'll show them this slide. And in the uh, words of our tweeting president, I'll just say, wash your damn hands. Okay. I said I didn't want to hyperventilate, and I did. Uh, i got to change the slide. Now we'll go over personal protective equipment. This, you can use a PAPR, which is a personal airway-powered respirator, uh, which has a mask, and so it has eye protection with it, but it's equivalent to an N95 or eye protection. We have our N95 mask, but don't forget to put on the eye protection if you do that. And you probably want to get the other mask that has the shield if you're going to intubate or something like that, because the goggles stuff can go around. Everybody needs to have on gowns and gloves as well. And then all hospitals uh, should have EPA-approved disinfectant. I know they do here at UofL, and they probably do at the VA as well. So if you don't know your concepts, you end up doing this, pouring chemicals in a drone and flying it all over creation, trying to kill SARS-CoV-2 in an entire atmosphere over an 11 million person city. Okay, so that's not going to uh, probably work too well. I'll tell you where they need to fly that thing is fly it in here. And this is where they think SARS-CoV-2 may have started. And in those markets, what you've got, the problem is you've got humans very close to animals, that live animals that can also harbor influenza and selling uh, other exotic animals that may harbor some of those things. So uh, before you go pointing your finger at those Chinese, I want you to remember what's going on in our Kentucky backyards. I, th I think this is the index case of swine flu. Okay. So 
It's easy to disseminate something once you have an airport and you're flying all over the earth. So you, you can see why maybe the first cases in the United States were in Washington, multiple in California, Arizona, Illinois, Massachusetts, all those places were the first cases. Now these people, I've, I've renamed this from uh, China discovery to coronavirus discovery. These people eventually will maybe come and, and show up in your clinic. So then you need to know what to do. So the CDC has provided this flowchart to help guide you through. You can just Google CDC flowchart. You don't even need to type in coronavirus. It's got so many hits on it. Um, anyway, in the when somebody checks in, then they don't need to be sitting down for 20 minutes if they have a history that you're asking and they have any symptoms. So certainly you want to hand them a mask at that point and then escort them to a designated room in your clinic. One that's hopefully close to the bathroom so that if they have to go, they don't have to tramp all the way through the entire clinic to get there. They should keep their mask on in the room. A sign should go on the door that says isolation. And then the healthcare worker next, under the blue, can go and interview them and ask them more details about their travel, details about their symptoms, and then you can call the health department at 574-8200, uh, and they will decide if your person is a person under investigation or not. And there are some strict rules here, but basically they're going to ask about the travel history and the uh, symptoms of the patient, so that's why you want to have those details. They may even have you go back in the room and ask something more to clarify. So at that point, if they say this is not a person under investigation, then you just go about your business in your clinic as usual. And if that person has the flu, then you probably want to keep their mask on. But if they say it is a person under investigation, then they're going to go one of two ways, and that's either home or the hospital. So if they end up going home, you want to keep them uh, that mask on them all the way out the door and then clean the room with the environmental cleaning agent that I talked about before. If they get admitted, then um, again, you want to make sure they stay when the ambulance people come or however they're getting there. They may even ask them to drive themselves if they're not too bad. Um, but make sure they wear their mask out the door and again, you clean the room. So let's now go over clinical management. <clears throat> there is no treatment, there is no vaccine at this time. But we do offer symptomatic relief and we monitor the patients. We give them hydration with IV fluids, some degree of oxygenation, and even intubation if they need it. The tidal volume is a tad lower than um, what we are accustomed to. And you can titrate the PEEP based on the oxygenation and keep the plateau pressure around 30. So some lessons from the original SARS was that uh, aerosol humidification tended to uh, increase the droplet transmission, as did non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Then if you use manual bag ventilation, switching the patient from the ventilator to that manual bag also increased the aeration of the virus. And ribavirin and gancyclovir simply don't work. So here's some drugs under investigation, some of which we recognize and some we don't. Oseltamivir for the flu has been tried. Lopinavir, ritonavir, which we used to use commonly for HIV, and another PI called nefamostat. There's uh, interferon alpha and interferon beta 1b has been in some studies with lopinavir, ritonavir. Then a few RNA polymerase inhibitors. The uh, remdesivir was used in the first patient in Washington State, and it appeared to uh, improve his outcome. Then some others that we're used to, nitazoxanide and chloroquine. And for those of you looking for CBD oil, it ain't on this list. <laughs> the NIAID is working on a vaccine based on those viral spike proteins that I mentioned earlier. So now we'll go over the future of coronavirus in Louisville. There's two ways for coronavirus to come to Louisville. And one is in a spontaneous, haphazard, uh, out of control basically way. And that's for somebody just to show up at the ER, or show up in your clinic. So then we have to scramble, okay, we've had this person, who do we screen now and how? Um, we do have our isolation precautions part down, what we should wear. 
But then what do we treat them with? We can grab oseltamivir or lopinavir, ritonavir off the shelf, but uh, what about remdesivir? That seemed to have worked, but then you have to, ahead of time, um, ask for an IND and have that mailed here. The other way, which is a lot more in a controlled environment, is just to have it shipped here in a sealed vial by mail to the BSL-3 laboratory, which it was last week. So now we can take that, and it's from this first patient from um, Washington from the 2019, you know, SARS-CoV-2, and in an organized fashion, and we can prepare, and now we can test, we can uh, say who should get tested and, and what body fluids. We can test cheek swabs, stool, urine, all these different things, and decide what's the best way when we have to screen people down the road if we do. We can work on some prevention. I'm happy to be a part of a drug called Griffithsin, but we, we got a grant for that to test for um, influenza and end-stage HIV disease, but it also has coverage for adenovirus and, lo and behold, coronavirus. So now we can use that in the lab. Um, we can also test remdesivir. RNA polymerase inhibitors and others, and not just in vitro because our lab is so good, we can use it in ferrets, rodents, medical students, all kinds of people. So what we have here when this happens is clinical translational research. This is the true meaning of the word. We have the bench to the bedside and you apply it. So I'm happy to be a part of UofL at this time. So in conclusion, SARS-CoV-2 is more contagious than endemic HCoV and influenza, and it has a higher inpatient mortality rate. SARS-CoV-2 infects the young as well as the old, and patients tend to have a, no, a normal to low white blood cell count, increased fibrinogen, increased LDH, and bilateral infiltrates. Proper infection prevention and control is imperative. We want to apply what we learned from the 2002 version of coronavirus to this one, and Louisville is preparing locally and nationally for SARS-CoV-2. It is still an evolving situation, so recommendations from the CDC may change and new treatments, vaccine may become available. And for your sake and your patient's sake, please wash your hands. Thank you. Today we discussed that we want to have 15 minutes for the questions and, and answers. He has touched on the collaboration that we have with the Center for Prevention and our Center of Education. As we speak, we are getting several meetings on, on how we want to move our research with several things on the on the there's a lot of activity going on uh, at the University of Forest Mention. Perhaps we need to be ready for us to be ready if this were to happen here. Uh, comments or questions for Forest? We are, okay, Forest, you, you, you direct because you want okay. to be a lot of. Yes. Yeah. Those are New York Times topics, and I can't comment on either one only because I have no idea. I, I can't tell you what China government is going to do or the American government. Um, is it a good idea about the wet markets? Probably, because as you see, we have humans and these animals so close together, and there's no regulation of those markets either. So they just bring these animals in, and, um, and then you've got flu. Now, you asked something about the U.S. Oh, the... The funding, yeah, I don't know about funding. Sorry. Uh, I, I, as some people say that, that probably um, this novel coronavirus was the best thing that happened to wild animals. We are going to leave them alone. <laughs> I don't start. Then probably it's good for them. Yes. Oh, for you. Yeah. Do we know if it's in people who have a stronger immune response? Oh. Ah, no, I don't know what their immune response is, but it is interesting that the people are younger, so you can 
kind of assume that they would, except that those younger people had more comorbidities. So maybe it's not. And, and the early study, remember, had a lot younger population, but as we accumulated all the studies, you know, then the age, the mean was 57 instead of, you know, 30 or so. Oh, I'm sure it is. And I saw that headline like, the eye is the portal of entry. Well, the eye is the portal of entry for flu and a lot of respiratory viruses because it goes to a mucous membrane. Um, so that's not a surprise, and I'm sure it is. I think other questions are, what about the stool? Is that a, a means? Is, it, is contact a, uh, a, a way that's very efficient for this virus to transmit, or is it primarily just a droplet isolation? I don't think it's respiratory, and the difference there is that with tuberculosis, you'll breathe it out and it'll float down the hall, but with droplets, it comes out on the droplets, they're heavy, and gravity brings them down. Correct, and if they're in a negative pressure room, they wouldn't have to wear a mask. Who? Yes, but you're not talking about somebody who has all three um, isolation precautions because we don't have anybody in that. But you're, you're talking about one or two of them. And yes, in fact, you have less people going in the room when they have isolation. So they tend to trade one for the other. I used to work at another hospital and they had uh, for MRSA, respiratory and contact. So people, I could see doctors and they'd be like, well, I'll do one, but not both. So they put a mask on and they wouldn't put on gloves. <laughs> So, you know, MRSA is more contact. Anyway, that was back when it was contact. Yes, somebody have another question? Yes. They, they do before their onset of symptoms. You're talking about somebody that ends up never getting a disease? <laughs> That's a hard population to study. I, I haven't seen any um, uh, studies with that, except that one said that People do are contagious before they have their symptoms, but they go on to have disease. So you're asking about a population that's just colonized. Yeah, yeah, I'm not aware of any studies about that yet. There have been a lot of studies with coronavirus, but just those nine or ten that had uh, people who actually had SARS-CoV-2. The rest of them are um, articles just talking about it and not and not of the people who actually had it. This, this is all uh, again. This is all evolving. Just yesterday, you know, in New England, there was these 120 uh, Germans that came, that the, flu, the government flew back. Uh, if you were symptomatic, you were uh, separated. For 105, they were completely asymptomatic. Still, from these asymptomatic, they did the PCR, and they got two persons with positive PCR that were completely asymptomatic. And until yesterday, there were seven days, and they were still asymptomatic. Uh, then you have, pro, if these numbers were to translate, you have you may have two percent of the population being asymptomatic. Now, are these patients going to develop disease next week? Are they are in the 14-day incubation period. We don't know. Then, as Forrest mentioned, maybe that everybody is going to develop disease. But the question is that before disease. Yes, you're going to be able to transmit the... Yeah, so we're reminding each other of studies that we've seen. Um, one of them said that uh, they checked stool in people. So people that had disease, they could detect coronavirus in the stool, but they also detected it in people who didn't have the disease. So apparently were exposed. So uh, what they don't know is then, is that enough coronavirus to transmit to somebody else? And again, I want to emphasize what Forrest mentioned, that, that the, most of the nosocomial transmission in China occurs in patients that are right to the hospital, not with pneumonia, not with respiratory symptoms. One patient with severe abdominal pain was sent to surgery. And this was the first manifestation of COVID-19. And then in a couple of days, the patient developed pneumonia. But initially, it went to a different world. And then there are surgeons that became infected. And as he mentioned, we have to be aware of different clinical presentations. 
somebody else. 